know, the verse of scripture that haunts me all the time. You know, in James where it says, don't be quick to become teachers of, because you incur a greater judgment upon yourself. I'm very always aware of what my position is. And so I strive always to be as faithful to the magisterium of the church, the true teaching of the church in everything. And where there is speculation or room to wiggle around, I let you know that. And you can make your own decision. Okay? Uh, where, where we have to believe by faith, that is clear. That is clear. Where we have speculation, which is something that we're going to get to tonight, that's, it's just that, speculation. No one will really know until it actually happens. But we can know what the eternal meaning is of this. And the reason I say that is that because it's in our scripture, it has a meaning that is meant for all Christians at all times. It's got to have that meaning, otherwise it wouldn't be there. This is why I critique the evangelicals for their approach to the book of Revelation, where it's all just the future, it's all just the future, it's all just about the Antichrist, it's all about the end of the world. Well, it is, there is that element to it, I'm not denying that, but what I'm saying is that it's not only that. There's got to be a meaning for us now. There's got to be a meaning for the first believers who read this. How did the first century readers understand this? How did they read the, the two witnesses? The woman and the dragon. The beast out of the sea and the earth. It had to have some meaning for them. Otherwise, why would God say this? Do you, you understand what I'm saying? And when you think about that, that way, about all scripture, then when you look into the books of like Leviticus or Chronicles, where you get this pages and pages and pages of all this tediousness, you go, what on earth was someone thinking? Why is this in here? It's boring. There's nothing to it. Think about the first chapter of Matthew. What is the first chapter of Matthew? We hear it every Christmas. The genealogy of Jesus. So and so begat, so and so begat, so and so. Who cares? Tell me a parable that Jesus spoke. Who cares about this? Right? That's the first reaction. But it's there for a reason. And that is what causes you to go, well, why is this here? If God didn't think it mattered that we knew the genealogy of Jesus, we would have it in our scripture. That makes, you hear what I'm saying? So when you look at this, it's got to have some sort of signification. So when we look at the book of Revelation, it can't only mean stuff in the end. It's got to have a, a value for us right here, right now. Otherwise, why would God have it in this? And I keep repeating myself on that because I know it's so easy to get wrapped up in all of this. The, sensation, all the, oh, it's scary, oh, the judgments, oh, all that kind of stuff. And you miss the, the, the message in all of that. Because there is a meaning in all of that. Again, if it didn't, why would God put it there? Okay? You good? Alright. With that, as you see at the top there, I promised you to, re to go over the quiz, and I will do that. I don't want to take a ton of time on this. I want to limit this to 20 minutes, no more than 30. And I'm not going to answer this. I want to hear from each of the tables. I want to hear what you know about this. Okay? And if you didn't do it, well... Okay. So, uh, 
there are four questions, four main questions that have come up learned everything that we have not yet. But highlight of elements from chapters four all the way through chapter nine, really. Because it talks about trumpets. So, the first question is chapter four of Revelation is called the liturgy, I call it the liturgy of creation. Chapter 5 is the Liturgy of Redemption. Tell me more about that. Why would I say that? Why would I say Chapter 4 of Revelation is the Liturgy of Creation, but Chapter 5 is the Liturgy of Redemption? You have the rainbow. description of he who sits on the throne, the throne is covered by a, a rainbow. Why is that important? What does the rainbow tell you? It's, it's Noah. You think of Noah and the flood and new covenant. The new beginning. It's the covenant that God made with Noah. Also, the bow is the symbol of that covenant. And what's significant about Noah is that he is very much a second Adam. The whole flood and the ark and the whole bit is like a second Adam and Eve story, really. Because if you think about it, what was on the ark? All the animals. And you have to feed animals, so what else is in there? Food! So all the food that they could gather, grains and whatnot, to feed the animals and the people that were there. How many people? Eight. 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 And what's significant about the number eight? New creation. See, it's all about the creation story. Okay? What else in chapter four lends you to think it's the liturgy of creation? That's very good. That's a, a very significant symbol in that vision. What else? Yes. Verse 11. Oh, we got an airplane going over us. But uh, <laughs> tell me, what, what's in verse 11? The creatures and elders worship and, and glorify God who created them. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you created all things. That's it. And by your will they existed you're celebrating God for making us in the entire world. That's exactly the thing. Got it. Excellent use of in the scriptures as well. How do we know this is a, a this is the praise of God? Praise of God how? For all creation. He created all things. So therefore all creation rightly gives him praise. That's why. Because you don't hear anything about Jesus or the redemption or anything like that in here. It's all about how God created everything. And how just that mere fact alone causes all to worship him. Now, what in chapter 5 shifts the focus? Ah, there's a different symbol. The Lamb of God. How does the Lamb look? Slain with Looks standing. like he's been slain, but standing. standing up. What's odd about that? He's alive, but he looks like he's been killed. So when you kill something, it rarely stays standing up. It just collapses. But this Lamb stands up. So that tells me this is a symbol, a sign, that this lamb, though looks dead, is still alive. It's still alive. And who is the Lamb of God? Jesus. Jesus. And who told us that first? Peter. John the Baptist. I was kind of alluding to today's Passion Day. Yes, it was John the Baptist who announced, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
That's what makes him the greatest of all the Old Testament prophets. Because all the other prophets prophesied that Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming, Jesus is coming. Did they ever see him come? No. Did Isaiah? No. Jeremiah? Ezekiel? Daniel? Daniel probably came the close, but it was a vision. And he didn't know it was Jesus. He didn't know it like we understand it. Hosea, Joel, Jonah, Zephaniah, Malachi, did any of those prophets? No, it was hundreds of years. And then John the Baptist comes. And he prophesies in the desert. And you know what he said? Look, there he is. <coughs> That's what made him the greatest of all the prophets. All the other prophets said he's coming, 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 never saw it. And it was John who said, I not only see it, but there he is. So, just want to point that out. What else in this vision tells me that this is about redemption? Verse 5. Okay, the root of David has conquered, and he can open the scroll. So you mentioned the scroll, Martha. What, what's important about the scroll? What is it? Okay, it's written on the front and the back. And what other item in the Old Testament was written front and back? The Ten Commandments. And where were they put? The Ark of the Covenant. So the Ten Commandments represent the covenant God made with his people at Mount Sinai. This scroll is written on front and back also. So what, is, what did I postulate to you is a possible interpretation of this scroll? What is it? The plan of God. The what? It's the new covenant. And who's the only one worthy to open that covenant and put it, in, put it into effect? Jesus. Jesus, because we just read that. It's the lamb that's worthy to open the scroll. He's the only one worthy. Okay? And what is the new covenant all about? Redemption. Thank you. The new covenant is a new covenant that forgives our sins. You, then Marie. Oh, I was just going to say it could be the plan of God for the world. It could. There are some commentators that do say that. That do say that the scroll could be the, the plan of the ages. God's, you know, divine blueprint. Uh, that's possible. I'm not going to say it's not. Uh, I would just argue that the only other place in the Old Testament that we see something written on the front and back is in, is the first place is the Ten Commandments. And then again, in Zechariah, chapter 3, he sees a vision of a flying scroll that's written on front and back. And then again, we see it here. So I would argue that the, the, the more common theme scripturally is that it's a covenantial theme. Because that's the bigger theme in all of the book of Revelation. It's telling us about the new covenant. Because it keeps telling us about how Jews are saved, and who else is saved? Gentiles. Gentiles. And when is that taking place the greatest? I bet that's the best way I can describe it. Under the new covenant. Now, under the old covenant, could Gentiles be saved?
Israel didn't live up to its vocation. They were supposed to show the world the wisdom of God and his law. God set up David in his throne to be a kingdom on earth to teach the nations. When did that happen? What was one incident that that happened? Solomon, Solomon and the Queen. Queen of Sheba, remember? The Queen of Sheba came and she said, I am now seeing for myself the kingdom of God. See, that's what Israel was supposed to do, be such a shining light to the nations that the rest of the world would come and worship the true God as he established it through Israel. Because they were the firstborn, didn't mean they were the last. The whole world was to convert through them. But what was the problem? It begins with an S. Sin. Sin, Sin was the problem. Israel couldn't keep their own law, so they couldn't teach the others. And it just, it just didn't, it didn't work. And so God said, I'm going to make a new covenant. And what I'm going to do in this new covenant is deal with this sin problem. Because that's what's hanging everyone up. And so God brought the new covenant. And this was inaugurated through and we are now living in the fruits of the new covenant. Okay. Marie. Oh, I just wanted to add that <coughs> um, chapter 5. Yes. Let me see. Uh, oh, verse 9. They start, they start singing, um, singing a new song and saying, Worthy are you, etc., etc. And they're celebrating the redemption. For you are slain. And by your blood, you ransom men for God. Yes. And then they continue. The what men? Just the Jews? All men. How do you know? Oh, oh you don't have your Bible. Oh, open. Yes, for every tribe and tongue and people and nation. There you go. Everyone. And is that new news? Say no. No. No, because under the old covenant, it was meant for whom? Everybody. Go back to Abraham. 